All right, good afternoon again, everybody, and welcome to our three o'clock panel. It is my very distinct pleasure to introduce my very good friend, Misha Simonovsky. He is currently a second year graduate student here at UT, seeking a dual degree in uh, at the LBJ School here and also at my home department of the, uh, well, the Center for Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies. So thank you very much, Misha, and um, looking forward to a fantastic panel. Thank you very much, Sergio, and thank you, everyone, for coming and attending. Uh, now let me introduce our two amazing speakers for today. Uh, first one on my far left is Anna Romandash, who is an award-winning journalist from Ukraine. Uh, she works as a reporter focusing on human rights, sustainable media development, and access to information. She has collaborated with Deutsche Welle, Freedom House, and Open Government Partnership. For her work in human rights, uh, Anna earned Media Freedom Ambassador Award. And uh, to my immediate left, uh, Dr. Ivana Stradner is a research fellow at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies and specifically at its Parish Center for Media Integrity. Dr. Stradner's work focuses on uh, Russia's information operations and cybersecurity, specifically on Russia's use of advanced hybrid warfare and their threat to the West. And she is also a special correspondent for Kyiv Post, which is one of the leading publications in English language relating to Ukraine. Yes, so it's my pleasure to welcome you both to the talk. Um, and um, Ivana, let's uh, start with you. Uh, so we always hear about uh, how Russia's military performed poorly in Ukraine, uh, less than most people suspected. It was supposed to be a second uh, military on the planet. Um, but also, President Putin likes to invoke nuclear weapons a lot. Or he doesn't say it directly, but... Um, so those are like two ends of the spectrum, poor performance versus world annihilation. Um, and then we also heard about Russia's interference in US presidential elections, and overall it's kind of menacing cyber forces. Uh, so uh, could you please enlighten us and describe the state of Russia's cyber forces and uh, their effort against Ukraine? And maybe you will cover that in your speech. Thank you very much for inviting me to speak with you today and for uh, organizing this absolutely fantastic conference um, that helps us all understand the complexity of um, information warfare coming from uh, different angles. So um, you're absolutely right. Russia's performance on the battlefield is not as something that we expected in 2022. But Russia's performance in the information space is still going quite well. Contrary to a popular belief, that Russia has lost the information war. I disagree with this statement, and that is because um, if you live in the Twitter bubble, uh, you may actually conclude that Russia has lost this information war. But uh, as someone who uh, lives in Washington, D.C., I always like to say that the world does not revolve around Brussels or around Washington, D.C. Probably the majority of people in this room will laugh when I say that uh, Russia's government believed that the U.S. government actually trained migratory birds to deliver bioweapons in Russia. You may also probably laugh um, if I tell you that the Russian government openly also talks about the United States developing ethnic weapons targeting specifically our Russian population based on uh, DNA that comes from the COVID tests. Uh, but the problem is that such disinformation campaigns uh, might actually uh, be laughable in this room, a lot of people across the globe still do believe in something like that, including in Africa, including in Asia, including in Latin America. So my first conclusion, and I'm happy to talk more about that, is that Russia has not lost the information war. Second point that I always want to, uh, that I want to make here is that if we want to counter Russia in the information space, we need to think like the Kremlin. Um, we can start with the assumption uh, using our, um, our culture, using our understanding on information warfare, uh, but that's not enough. Because let me tell you um, 
a very, very uh, simple fact is that there is not even a word cybersecurity in Russian language. They use information security. They only use cybersecurity when they refer to a foreign uh, cybersecurity operation. And that is not a question of uh, translation, um, some mistakes. The point of that is that Russia's uh, understanding of cybersecurity um, is um, uh, very different from the way that we understand. They combine both the technical part, what we call here cybersecurity, for example, attacks on critical infrastructure, but they also include the cognitive part of um, information security, uh, something we would call here psychological operations. And why that matters? It matters because they combine the two. Uh, they also combine the two given that they do not distinguish between war and peace. And the third thing is, within that uh, topic is that um, there is a very famous doctrine in Russia's military called reflexive control which is the critical thing when we are thinking about Russia's information warfare, which is that uh, they basically feed you with information um, that um, you make certain decisions that you think it'd be benefit, uh, they benefit you, but they actually uh, benefit your opponent. And Russia combines that both in information operations as well as uh, cybersecurity when they when they launch uh, offensive uh, attacks. So that's my third point that I can also you know elaborate uh, further later. Um, having said that, the third point that I also want to make is that we need to acknowledge that we are in the information war with Russia. Um, if they believe that, we better believe that as well. Having said that. Talking about information operations from some point as a propaganda tool, disinformation, misinformation, we can define it as a way you know that you want, but let's call a spade a spade. We are in the information war uh, with, uh, with Russia. Um, and the fourth point that I also want to make um, is that Russia considers information as a weapon. Our military, we do not here consider um, information as a weapon in the way that uh, Russia does. Um, Russia's military also openly talks about the value four to one kinetic to non kinetic to kinetic tools. They, I mean, their military strategies also openly say that whoever controls the information space uh, will uh, win the war. And my final point that I uh, really want to uh, make is that while uh, I firmly believe, um, and many people have mentioned this here, um, that we should build resilience, um, I also do believe that the United States should go on the offensive when it comes to information warfare and uh, put Russia uh, on the defensive so their intelligence should spend time, energy, and resources defending themselves from our information operations. We do not need to spread lies. The truth is on our side. And I'll just give you a very concrete example. This morning, I opened my Twitter and I saw a Russian um, embassy from South Africa uh, posting um, posting, uh, having a post, uh, something related to Afghanistan and how the United States is an unre unreliable ally. Whatever I personally think about Afghanistan, let's leave that aside. But I'm just curious, how come the United States did not use the wonderful opportunity to spread the truth about Russia's friendship um, and what it means, uh, given that uh, um, Armenia asked Russia uh, for help with CSTO um, and its relationship with Azerbaijan, and Putin just said, no. We should actually spread information, not disinformation, the truthful information. Russia is unreliable ally throwing their brothers um, under the bus. Um, this is just one of the examples that I'm just going to use given that I don't have enough uh, time to talk more about that, but more than happy to use more examples because the Kiomer research is really revolves around offensive information operations. So I will stop here and I very much look forward uh, to further discussion.
Uh, yes, thank you very much, Dr. Stradner. Um, and I want to uh, turn it over to Anna Romandash. Uh, and, uh, you know, because um, Ukraine became kind of a battlefield for information and cyber operations of Russian Federation, as, and as uh, Dr. Stradner talked about, uh, that Russia uses a strategy and the West needs to be prepared for it, but Ukraine was the first one to face it. And uh, could you um, address how Ukraine was successful, because that's largely considered a success. Um, well, I will try. Um, thank you. Um, so the title of my talk is Cyber Warfare Before and After the Russian Invasion of Ukraine, but I actually want to say that cyber part of the warfare and information warfare, it's, it's just a very small part of all that's going on in Ukraine or around Ukraine. Um, and sadly, it's not that... In 2022, the full-scale invasion happened, and this is when Ukraine first started experience cyber warfare as well. So cyber warfare started way before. It started even before 2014 annexation of Crimea and the war in Donbass. Uh, cyber warfare started way, way earlier, and not only toward Ukraine. So there were a bunch of countries in and outside of Europe that were targeted. Um, a famous example would be 2007 Estonian case, a major attack on a bunch of government websites when um, a Soviet era monument was uh, selected to be moved. So in Ukraine, cyber warfare really intensified after 2014. So a good example was, I believe it was 11, 11th of March, 2014, few days before the so-called referendum that Russians were organizing on Crimea. So two days before that, they launched a major cyber attack on um, different critical infrastructure in Ukraine, so energy infrastructure. And that playbook was repeated year after year. So um, 2015, around 200,000 uh, users were disconnected in Ukraine a huge attack on electricity grid. So it was Kyiv and also Western Ukraine. And then in 2017, there was this very funny virus. It was called um, Net Peta, and it was um, after Ukraine's president of the time, Petro Poroshenko, and I think Russian hackers had a lot of fun naming that virus. So that virus just basically destroyed a bunch of information, did a lot of bad stuff. And it didn't only target Ukraine, it targeted a bunch of countries around. and. It's, it's quite fascinating that Russia was able to carry out all of these cyber attacks and it was quite possible to trace it to Russia, to military structures within Russia. And a lot of countries, a lot of governments were just like, well, that's that. We're just, we're just going to ignore that. We're not going to name it um, a warfare. We're not going to address it as a case of hybrid warfare against our interest, against our security, digital security, and so on. So it was largely ignored that Ukraine was being attacked or other countries were being attacked um, at that time. And in addition, Russia has had a very successful army of trolls all over Europe, but outside of Europe as well, and a very good lobby in and outside of Europe. There are a lot of investigations that reveal a lot of payments that are being done to lobbies, politicians all over Europe. I think the, light, the latest case was Bulgaria, where um, journalists, lobbyists, and all sorts of people were getting around 2,000 euro payments um, through Russian embassies, through different organizations, just to kind of push Russian narratives and so on. Things started to change in 2022 with the full-scale invasion of Ukraine. And there are many different reasons for that. But one of the reasons, I think, it was that that invasion was just so obvious, so difficult to justify, even for the biggest Russia Putin apologist, that it was the first time when the voices of Ukrainians who were sounding the alarm for years were finally taken seriously. And when people were actually realizing, hey, we are at war, there is war in Europe. And that war takes a lot of different shapes and forms. And Ukrainian response to cyber warfare and information warfare on the Russian side has been generally considered successful, although to limitations, and I will speak more on that too. But um, why was it a success? That was your question. So limited success, right? So there are a few things that I would just like to note on why it worked and how. 
again, we're talking about a very unique case of a momentum where pe people outside of Ukraine actually started to listening and paying attention to what Ukraine was. So it's tricky, right? When for 30 years or so you have been um, dealing with a country that was generally overlooked or very often reported from the you know Russia-centric uh, perspective. So a lot of people didn't have enough information on what Ukraine was or is. So it was the Ukrainian government, civil society, a bunch of international volunteers who actually realized that this is a big gap and it's something that needs to be addressed. So um, first thing that they started doing, civil society, government, international community, all of these horizontal networks, formal and informal, is that they started emphasizing on the language and on the wording, right? So language in information warfare is extremely important. Uh, the way the war, the full-scale invasion has been framed before 2022 uh, and after is very often you would see words like Ukraine crisis, Ukraine war, things like this. Those are not factually correct, right? So it was a very important messaging from the Ukrainian media community. It is a Russian invasion of Ukraine. It is Russian-Ukrainian war. It is the Russian war. So if you, if you want to talk about something, at least use the correct terminology. So it was very important to actually start decolonizing that discourse and actually addressing those little information details that have often been overlooked. And an, a very important aspect of that is nothing about us without us. So if you want to talk about Ukraine, that's great, but make sure you actually have Ukrainian voices talking about Ukraine. So we're not talking about um, academic discussion with three Russian professors, maybe one American, and we're all happy clapping and talking about Ukraine. Uh, so that was a very important aspect of that. Another thing, and I think Ukraine didn't succeed in this one, was isolating Russian, uh, Russia in the digital space. So Ukraine's Ministry of Digital Infrastructure and the minister, Mikhailo Fedorov, uh, when the full-scale invasion started, he announced this big, very ambitious plan. Let's isolate Russia in the digital space. All of the big IT, digital, important companies, get out of Russia, please, so Russian uh, state, uh, war supporters don't have access to this crit critical digital infrastructure. And some companies did follow. So Apple, for example, exited, MasterCard exited a few companies. Uh, Facebook didn't want to exit, but then Russian government really helped it by banning it. And they also banned Instagram. But it's still pretty easily to access it if you have VPN. And majority of the companies remain operational in Russia. So part of what my team is doing, what we are researching, is actually we're tracking uh, sanctions evaders and how all of these digital companies are directly or indirectly helping Russia and helping Russian military on the battlefield, for example, Google, Google Maps, all of this kind of stuff, not, not even mentioning the chips that get into Russia through a lot of third parties. So this, this aspect of the um, hybrid warfare is, is still very much in development and it hasn't been successful yet. Then there's another case, it's called Ukraine's IT Army, and this is kind of a very good, I would say, um, case of um, cooperation between the governments and volunteers. Ukraine IT Army is roughly 100,000 digital volunteers who are um, semi-independent and whose job is hacking, hacktivism of all things related to the Russian military. So basically it's 100 thousand people who know how to hack, who have um, you know, computer science background and who are hacking Russian information channel, news media, um, state websites, state resources, and so on. So basically they are doing what Russia has been doing to Ukraine since at least 2014. And some of the things that they have been doing are relatively successful. I will give you one example that is controversial, but that does make sense in the environment of the warfare in, in, the, in the existing uh, situation of Russian-Ukrainian uh, Russian war. So uh, Ukrainian government partner with two organizations, Clearview and Palantir. So these are providing AI-driven solutions to basically identify people. So what does it mean? Uh, 
thanks to this partnership, Ukrainian government digital volunteers got access to a ton of visual data that helps to identify people. So this is being used why to identify Russian soldiers in Ukraine, to identify Russian soldiers who were linked to, for example, Bucha massacre, who were linked to any other human rights atrocities in Ukraine and who were killed in action. So after identifying these Russian soldiers, for example, who were linked uh, to Bucha massacre, their information was revealed and published online. So you could actually see these are the people who were doing um, all of these massacres. These are the people who were committing these crimes. And then this information was being later passed on for um, the war tribunals. And identifying dead Russian soldiers was used as a way of the psychological warfare against the Russian army, because knowing the names of the Russian soldiers who were killed, you could reach their family members who were most likely not informed by the Russian Ministry of Defense about what happened to their relatives. So this is something that the digital volunteers were doing. Um, this is an extremely successful case of psychological warfare, um, of actually targeting the relatives of the killed in battle soldiers, that we actually have verified information that this is what happened to your relative. And the Ministry of Defense of Russia is not going to tell you this. They're not going to reveal the real numbers and so on and so on. Another case that is less controversial was uh, basically um, reaching out to Russian soldiers who are currently on the territory of Ukraine, emailing them, sending them text messages about ways that they can give in to the Ukrainian army. And there are lots of digital ways that they can actually reach out, find the information and safely become prisoners of war, but at least be spared. Um, on the battlefield and so on, and open source data. So basically using all sorts of open source data for investigations, and we all know really good cases of very, very good investigative journalism uh, that, that did that. And the fourth thing that I think contributed to the informational success of Ukraine was um, these horizontal um, networks of digital volunteers outside of these very, you know, specific technical things, but mostly digital volunteers on social media. So you probably all heard of the NAFO movement. So North Atlantic Fellows Association organization, organization. Yeah. So this is basically um, people who very often use um, an avatar of Shiba Inu dog, and who are um, basically calling out Russian propaganda and Russian misinformation on social media, and they're calling it for what it is. So they would engage a lot of uh, Russian state figures, Russian politicians, propaganda people um, on social media, on Twitter, and they would engage them in these discussions, and they would often ridicule them and show them why whatever it is that they are saying is wrong. And if, I think a very famous example was when um, a Russian ambassador in Vienna started actually arguing with um, a NAFO, like a um, digital volunteer who had like a, a dog avatar. And the guy was like, well, look at this case. Here's an ambassador actually uh, arguing with a digital dog on Twitter and losing in this discussion. So this is kind of the case. Uh, NAFO fellows are very much English speakers. So they're very much oriented for the English speaking audience. And they're quite a phenomenon because they have actually been recognized by a bunch of governments, a bunch of institutions, and so on. Um, there are limitations to the successes. Um, I do agree that while Ukraine has been largely successful in communicating its message across to the English-speaking world, um, it is not the same case when we're talking about the non-English speakers or if we're talking about regions outside of the Western world. So if you're talking about Asian countries, South American countries, African countries, um, there there's still a very important impact of the Russian propaganda. So there's a need to create localized content um, and to actually understand what's happening in the information space out there. Because people there may not be using the same channels uh, to, tar uh, to, to get their information. They may not they may be using all sorts of different languages. They may be listening to all sorts of different influencers. So it's, it's very important to actually understand that gap and address that. 
um, Russian psychological operations, Russian information warfare is not going anywhere. So, you know, there are a lot of cases of what about ism, you know, why are we talking about Ukraine all the time? Let's talk about something else. It's like, we can talk about different things, you know, it doesn't mean that you have to start that uh, conversation about Ukraine takes away from a conversation about a different country or a different issue. You know, you can have different conversations. Uh, definitely a lot of imperialist, ignorant tropes that are still being used and reused all the time. So they're definitely not helping Ukraine. The fact that a lot of people didn't know anything about Ukraine for 30 years is really not helping, right, in communicating what Ukraine is. Um, cyber attacks are not going anywhere. They continue to still limited success from the Russian side. And obviously there is a very short attention span if we're talking about Western audiences or any audience really, right? People get tired of things. People want new things or people just want to rest and chill and not care about any cyber, any warfare anywhere. So these are some of the disadvantages that the Ukrainian digital response, that the Ukrainian volunteers, government and um, everybody else would have to consider while planning their strategy in the future. Uh, thank you for this comprehensive answer, uh, Anna. And uh, Dr. Stradner, I wanted to turn it over to you. Uh, could you please uh, describe uh, how Russia's information warfare is different from the Soviet approach? Uh, how did the Soviets conceptualize it? Uh, which government bodies were tasked with developing it? And how did it get passed over to the modern Russian Federation? And how it relates, I know it's a lot of questions, but how it relates to the Gerasim of doctrine, which became sort of infamous a few years ago. So to begin with, when people talk about Russia's information warfare, they often people in the West think about 2016 um, American elections. And that's a huge problem because um, we go back and forth here in the US every election cycle we talk about Russia, when in fact Russia has been waging the information war against the United States for decades. This is not, nothing new. The only thing that is new is really technology. Uh, and I will also tell you a few actually examples uh, how the tools, actually not the tools, but the methods are very, very similar. So back even during the Cold War, but not even during the Cold War, Russia also had um, information, um, they didn't call them like that, operations like uh, uh, efforts and tools even 100 years ago. Um, but with the Cold War, um, uh, Russian military uh, had a special even um, unit uh, that was conducting information operations. Uh, they also call them um, active measures uh, against the United States. Uh, 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 it was much difficult, you know, much more difficult back then to infiltrate with the New York Times versus nowadays uh, when you can spread um, any information that you want on on social media, but not only social media, they operate also through different uh, uh, through different blogs, through social media influencers. Um, so uh, the tools nowadays are just uh, different. And I'll actually give you a very concrete example. Um, actually, that's my favorite example when I talk about uh, Russia's active measures during the Cold War. Um, uh, the Soviet Union they accused the United States of um, um, of creating um, HIV uh, virus. It was called the Denver uh, Operation. And uh, that particular uh, campaign started, uh, they, they were able to deliver through India this information uh, specifically to explain actually how the United States is targeting also people in Africa. And it, you know, spread all over, uh, all over the world. And uh, again, you know, people can laugh in this room about that, I can guarantee you, and I know people who still believe in, in, in things like that. What is different in the 21st century is that everything what you hear about Russia's bioweapons program is, uh, again, you know, nothing new because uh, the messages are very, very similar that you, Russian Minister of Defense, they accused the United States of uh, creating even COVID. They also, 
accused the United States of operating biolabs. As I mentioned, a couple of funny examples uh, where the United States is training migratory birds, using bats, using uh, mosquitoes um, to deliver bioweapons. Uh, then they became a little bit more um, tech advanced. So uh, they give us a credit, you know, that we can also use drones for such delivery. Uh, but they didn't stop there because last year, um, uh, they also accused the United States of uh, creating uh, monkeypox. And that was actually a fascinating example because um, they used the real event that happened in 2021 in a Munich conference uh, with a military, actually it was uh, just a case study when they used uh, uh, monkeypox uh, debate. Uh, there were numerous representatives across the globe attending that meeting, and uh, the outcome of that uh, simulation was that the monkeypox uh, outbreak will start in May 2022, and it will kill thousands and thousands of people. And guess what? I woke up one day in May, I opened my Twitter, and I saw numerous hashtags related to monkeypox. And I was like, what's going on there? So it started, actually, I, I opened an um, uh, Russian Minister of Defense uh, 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 journal uh, where they openly accused the United States of engineering monkeypox. And then they use social media platforms, you know, to, to spread uh, that disinformation, also including, thank you, uh, TikTok specifically targeting uh, American youth. Uh, I've been writing about that, so I don't want to go into all those tiny details. But the reason why I'm emphasizing this particular example, because this is all linked to even the latest disinformation campaign where they accused the United Kingdom of uh, using depleted uranium on the territory of, of Ukraine. And that was all, like they were setting those informational conditions right before uh, when um, Serbia uh, uh, marked uh, the anniversary of NATO intervention because Russia has been influencing um, um, their, the population that NATO used depleted uranium there. So they linked the two and that happened literally in the matter of days. So uh, uh, I think I really just used a very concrete example to tell you that this is nothing new. Uh, that Russia has been using that for decades, and um, it will. And I don't think you know Russia will stop using similar measures anytime soon because even when Russia, Russian information operations, they're very adaptive and very flexible. So even when they don't work and they realize they don't work, they they change them. Um, so they have numerous. Uh, uh, platforms, you know, where they use that. So you use NAFO. Uh, Russia also has a similar, um, they call it a grassroots movement called uh, Cyberfront Z that operates on Telegram, uh, which is absolutely not a, a grassroots movement, uh, where Russia is literally providing people with memes, with pre pre-made memes, giving them guidance on how to go after people, on how to actually even hack people. Um, uh, so uh, this is all uh, th this is all, you know, uh, working and, um, and it's a very, very vast uh, tool set, you know, uh, that, they, that they have. Uh, yes, thank you, Dr. Stratner. Um, Anna, I wanted to ask you uh, about, um, you were talking about how uh, Russia has waged this information warfare against Ukraine since 2014 and even earlier and against other countries. So uh, the question is, was Ukraine ready for this type of full or partially uh, full uh, um, of uh, cyber offensive, informational offensive in 2014, and how did Ukraine ready itself uh, for for it in 2022? He talked about Mikhailo Fedorov. Uh, just for the audience, he could be our uh, opening speaker, but something just didn't uh, work out the last moment because he was uh, um, he was promoted to a, a position in the cabinet of ministry of uh, cabinet of ministers of ukraine but uh, di uh ministry of digital transformation of ukraine the cyber forces um many other things uh could you uh, uh tell us uh if ukraine had any of those capabilities or there was something else in 2014 and what changed in 2022 so I, I don't think that 2014 Ukraine was too ready for anything, right? Neither 
the actual army was super prepared for what was happening. Neither the civil society was prepared for um, this amount of a lot of information attacks, cyber attacks, and so on. But it's it's a it's important to differentiate between different groups of population and who is supposed to be doing what when some attacks of this sort happen. So I don't think that at that time, for example, the government had enough capacities um, to counteract very successful cyber attacks that some of them were happening um, and targeting um, a lot of critical energy infrastructure in Ukraine and so on. And it's also important to understand that, that t at that time, especially, and now still, Russia had continues having way more resources for waging um, cyber warfare against Ukraine, against other countries. So that was a little bit tricky. And I think another thing about cyber warfare is that um, it's kind of like a terrorist attack. You only need to make a mistake once. You only need to let the enemy succeed once for that damage to be done. Uh, so you have to be basically working, operating, verifying that information, protecting your resources all the time. So it's it's really tricky to basically bulletproof yourself completely from any sort of cyber warfare. And I don't think Ukraine was very ready for that at that time. And it's, it's important to understand that it was also 2014. It was the year of a lot of political turmoil. It was basically when the previous government was, was gone. So there was a lot of changes taking place in Ukraine. And just like Ukrainian army was kind of being built or rebuilt thanks to the cooperation with the civil society, with the new government, with new institutions that were being introduced. It was the same with digital capacities, information capacities of Ukraine. I think in 2022, what changed is that Ukraine did have that period of eight years to increase its um, qualifications, capacity, ability to respond. And I also think um, another thing that could have downplayed, for example, the influence of the Russian cyber warfare is that um, a lot of people who are responsible, a lot of people who are doing those cyber attacks, they probably were not aware that the full-scale invasion is going to happen right then back then and that. So this also may be um, played to the advantage of um, the Ukrainian side. And I think also because the resources that were generally given to all of these troll factories, hackers, whoever it is, um, they somewhat diminished because more resources were needed for the actual warfare. So I think these could be the reasons. But again, um, this is not a static thing. You cannot just say, we won let's move on. You know, this is something extremely dynamic. So just because Russia has not been able to target or achieve its cyber objectives during 2020, 22, it doesn't mean it's not going to continue trying. It's definitely going to throw more resources and try to target Ukraine as well as its allies more throughout the future years. Um, but I also think that Russians are probably not reevaluating what it is that they want to achieve by targeting, um, for example, Ukrainian digital infrastructure, Ukrainian critical infrastructure, and so on. And I do think, for example, a lot of carpet bombing that was happening in Ukraine, it kind of made a lot of cyber attacks on critical infrastructure useless, because if you're going to bomb a critical infrastructure, you don't need to hack it. So I think that was also something that went into the logic of a lot of uh, Russian military. That could be it. Uh, but it's definitely something that is going to evolve and Ukraine needs more support, more resources to be able to counteract that as time goes by. Yes, thank you, Anna. And uh, I wanted to ask if our audience has any questions. Yes, sir, I see your hand. Anybody has a mic? One second now. Give it to you, sir. Thanks. It's Marcos Kunalakis at the Hoover Institution, and thank you for your work. Um, I know the next panel is going to talk about your question of offensive and how do you deal with this from, uh, from a United States and Western perspective, but I think it was such an important point, which is that uh, we're not really uh, countering or, or attacking, counterattacking. And 
I'd like to ask the question on, uh, in, if I may, in two parts. The first part is, it seems that doctrine doesn't allow that to be the case. I mean, while we have psyops as an as a part of our defense department strategies, and when there's kinetic activity, we're pretty good at it. In fact, by uh, controlling the information space. So, uh, is that? part of the issue that you see and that we don't yet sort of use the expertise of our defense department in other aspects of our diplomacy in other uh, in other ways and if i can ask just a brief second one does does the new relationship or the evolving relationship with china affect the types of offensive work that you see in russia uh, okay thanks for those Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for this question. And you're absolutely right that DOD uh, has, I'm confident to say, um, excellent uh, capabilities to wage uh, offensive psychological operations. But we also do distinguish between war and peace, unlike Russia. And that's, you know, number one thing. The second thing is we also have the State Department, but public diplomacy always, you know, requires messages that has to be, you know, linked to, say, provided by the U.S. government. And uh, nowadays, uh, unfortunately, we live in such a space that if you want to wage an information war, your messages needs to resonate with uh, with your audience. Having said that, the Russian government does not need to think about reputation when they post spicy, funny, s sarcastic uh, memes on, on Twitter. Uh, USDOD, I'll just give an example, it took them 22 days to develop a meme um, that was, in my view, absolutely not um, an effective meme uh, that could resonate with a Russian audience. Um, just the very first fact that I mentioned Cyber Front Z, they provide like on a daily basis meme, here you are, just do it. Um, the problem is also a risk aversion in American politics. Um, in order to conduct um, offensive information operations, you have to take risks. And unfortunately, American politics um, rewards risk aversion. Um, there were, you can just find out, you know, that even Facebook, if I'm not mistaken, they caught DOD bots, um, unauthentic accounts, what they call them. Um, there were like 30 accounts, which is literally nothing. I can guarantee you any teenager can sit on uh, his couch and make, you know, such 30 bots and conduct, you know, such information operations. So it's not, we do not have here problem with capabilities. We here much have, I think, problem with the resolve. Uh, and that's something, you know, much bigger philosophical question on how to change change that um, in the long run because uh, information war will not leave. And this leads me to your next question about China. Um, uh, China and Russia are more and more cooperating in this field. As a matter of fact, two weeks ago, they made another deal uh, and um, bilateral deal in the information space. China is learning a lot from, from Russia. They are still learning their audience and how to deliver messages, but Russia has, uh, Russia has what I like to say, the brain for information operations, and China has money. And you will see more and more cooperation in that field. And um, as I mentioned, you know, uh, during my uh, initial remarks, it is tremendously important for the United States to build a to build resilience in sense of teaching people what is this information, et cetera, et cetera. But in my view, this is not enough. Uh, we did this during the Cold War. We put Russia on the defensive, and I don't see any reason why we should not do this again. Again, I do understand that this is very controversial for many people to say this, and I do not think that the U.S. should uh, wage ever information war uh, with lies because the truth is on our side. When they accused us of uh, launching bio weapons um, inside Russia, we should actually use the truth, maybe even during the Cold War and talk about Chernobyl. No wonder why Putin hated that movie and banned it inside Russia. They hate to be ridiculed, they hate really to be mocked, and uh, we have all the tools possible, we understand their thinking. It's really just a matter of, of uh, whether we are ready or not. Um, Anna, if you have anything to add, please, or if not, we can have one more question, I think. Or, no, people are telling me that we don't have time. Yes, we have to move to another panel, sorry. Yes. 
Please join us, yes.